Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. A topic we've explored frequently on the podcast is the huge impact our early life experiences can have on us. And particularly, the relationship that we have with our primary caregivers when we're young can mold us in lasting ways. One pattern that can arise in parent-child relationships occurs when the parent is a bit more emotionally vulnerable and the child is particularly emotionally intelligent. In these cases, an inversion of the typical dynamic can occur, where the child devotes themselves to meeting the parent's emotional needs rather than the other way around. And this can lead the child to lose touch with their own wants and needs, with their authentic self, which then can show up in adulthood as underlying feelings of worthlessness, uncertainty, and self-alienation. One of my favorite books on this topic is Alice Miller's The Drama of the Gifted Child. Learning about this material was a total eye-opener for me, and I'm really excited to share it with you today. I'm joined, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? Really well, Forrest. And this material is soulful and haunting. Mm. And when I read Miller's book, I thought, how did she know what my childhood was like? Mm -hmm. How did she know so clearly what it was like? And so many people have had a similar experience. So I'm so delighted that in your usual masterful way, you've prepared a lot of great material. You've done a thorough review of this topic territory. Oh, thanks, Dan. And we're going to get into some great stuff. And I really yeah. encourage people, as you listen, to ask yourself, what fits? And stuff that doesn't fit, yeah, it doesn't fit, exactly. Or, yeah, I got a mild little case of that, but no big deal. But, whoa, this little, this word, or that event, or that dynamic, oh, wow, that really fits. And then we're also going to get into what we can do about it to free ourselves increasingly of these patterns, in part through having insight into them. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. And before we uh, really dive in here, I just want to give people a couple of quick reminders First, please remember to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're currently listening on. It really does help us out. And then second, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses like deep dives into the research behind these episodes, uh, transcripts, and ad-free versions of every episode. So one version of what we're talking about here, Dad, is known as parentification. And then there's this distinction between parentification formally and these more subtle versions of being the so-called gifted child. And I would love if you could kind of explain that distinction to people. So it's normal in relationships that other people do stuff for us. We also do psychological functions. We serve people in various ways. We're friendly, we're soothing, we're advice-giving, we're reassuring. We, you know, raise our eyebrows at certain misbehaviors. You know, we, we influence each other. All that's very normal. The problem begins when we start to use people as means to our own ends in ways that are not so good. And in extreme forms, we can start regarding others as a kind of it to our I. And you can know what it feels like to be itted by someone or to be used as a means to their end, even in ways that are kind of shocking. And in the extremes of that, you, you're on the receiving end, let's say, of a narcissistic sociopath, and sure. you discover, wow, it was all a con. I actually don't exist mm -hmm. for you as a being mm -hmm. who can suffer and who matters in their own right. Yeah. That's an extreme for, version. A related form of this has to do with what's called self-psychology, which was a kind of mm -hmm. offshoot of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. But it's the notion, essentially, that another person becomes like a plug-in module that we plug into ourselves to sustain a coherent, adequate, uh, functioning sense of self. And the term for that is self-object. They become a, a person that's treated like an object who then regulates us as long as they're plugged into our motherboard. <laughs> but if they suddenly, as a 12, 14-year-old child, say, you know, I'm my own person. I'm not having it anymore. You know, being the therapist to my depressed mother, let's say, and that self-object is withdrawn, that plug-in module is withdrawn, that can be extremely dysregulating to an individual, mm -hmm. let's say, parent, and even to a family system. So then the parent in the system tries to keep the kid plugged in, you know, still. So this is an overarching kind of way of talking about it. 
Yeah, and one of the phrases that you had while we were prepping for this that really stood out for me is this idea of serving a psychological function. Is the kid a kid? Do they have their own identity, their own independence, their own ability to gain contact with uh, their own interior, to discover what's true for them, to be, to be the way that they want to be and show up in the world in that way? Or does the parent need them to serve some kind of psychological function in order to meet their own needs? Um, because the gift in this case of the gifted child is not like an intellectual gift where we, we might talk about like a gifted program or something like that. It's the gift of emotional sensitivity. And the child is so aware of the needs of the parent and is also aware as a very vulnerable being in the world that the best way to stay in relationship with the parent and receive love from them is by meeting those emotional needs. So they devote themselves to fulfilling the parents' needs rather than addressing their own. And that's where a lot of these experiences of uh, self-alienation is something that Miller talks about a lot in the book can come up for people. Yeah, so the child then is in this inverted situation in which a kind of bargain yeah, yeah. is struck that mm -hmm. basically says things will keep on going fine as long as. As long as yeah, X, yes. Y, or Z, as long yes. as uh, I suppress my own natural aliveness and walk within extremely narrow bounds to help you mm -hmm. stay calm. Or as long as mm -hmm. I don't tell uh, mom about your drinking. And it's poignant because, as you say, it's the gifts of the child of various kinds, including their lovingness, their sweetness, their loyalty to the parent, their clear seeing of the crummy marriage that their parents are in and their desire to do something about it. For example, even as a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old or a four-year-old intuitively, let alone as a teenager. So then what happens with this inversion of what should be the right bargain, essentially, which is the parent should be a means to the end of the needs of the child, actually, in a developmentally evolving way, that gets inverted, and then these things that are beautiful gifts of the child become corrupted or become tainted in some way. They become associated with difficulty. So then later on in life, how do you manifest, let's say, your natural gifts as a, let's say, a caring and thoughtful person without immediately getting sucked into the slippery slope that you become a caretaker of of the other people. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that really stood out to me about this whole territory is the idea of self-definition. In other, in other mm. words, just how do you define yourself? Yeah. And how do you define yourself relationally with others, right? Because, in again, unless you're a total sociopath or a total narcissist, we all define ourselves to a degree through our relationships. Yeah. I am me and I have this relationship with my dad that is like X. You are part mm -hmm. of my self-identity. Yeah. I am Rick's son. Yeah. You know, so we have those those normal relational schemas that happen. But what often happens in these gifted child or full-on parentification situations is that the child begins to only define themselves through relationship. I am worthy based on what I can do for others, specifically what I can do for my primary caregivers. We aren't worthy just because of of you know being a being we're only worthy through those relational structures and that can create a lot of consequences for people in a lot of different kinds of ways and also can really separate us from any kind of feeling of what we want what we want to do in the world how we want to show up what really matters to us and a lot of people who struggle to identify their own wants and needs can often find a, a um, at least an odor of this structure in their own childhood. It's obviously, there are a lot of reasons that somebody might struggle to figure out what they want and need in the world, but this is a major possibility for a lot of people. It's kind of a super highway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> many, many. Yeah, I, for I've, sure. I was on, you know, and yeah. uh, it, it, and as you say, then, we, you know, we're adaptive, right? So it yeah. works to become, in effect, cast into a certain role in the script mm -hmm. of your family, the story yeah, line, totally. that is systemic and in which mm -hmm. even if, let's say, the primary action is with one particular parent, the other mm. parent and the other siblings and maybe key relatives also play a role in that system. They're playing roles. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, not in malevolent kinds of ways, but there's a equilibrium of, of a particular storyline that tends to resist change because it serves functions as it is for key powerful people in it, notably the parents. 
So here you are, then you land in adulthood on top of whatever has been the issues through your youth, and you're just used to acting in certain ways. Or also, there's a sense that other kinds of ways, maybe really speaking freely, being emotionally vulnerable, being really disclosed, being firm, setting boundaries, uh, are, you know, they got punished or they were, you know, anathema in some way as a kid. So those normal ways of being in which you would build out, we talk about fill out the invisible, push back the invisible bars of your cage, um, you know, become really scary. You used a word earlier that I think is is a really perfect word here, which was systemic, how these issues can become systemic inside yeah. of families. And that uh, provides a really nice transition for us to talk a little bit about where these kinds of issues tend to come from. And something that I want to highlight here, which is really important, is that most of the time, parents are not deliberately trying to do this to their children. Yeah, They're caught up in their own unresolved material, and they're using the relationship that they have with their kids as a way to manage their own unmet emotional needs. These things often get passed down inside of families. And so the roots of any kind of parentification, whether it's this more kind of gifted child, um, emotional sensitivity version, or forms where kids are really stepping forward and needing to um, mediate the relationship between their parents, for example. The roots of this are found in the parents' own unmet needs. They never got what they wanted from that person, their, their spouse, their own parents, their friends, their job, their life. And now they finally have this impressionable, vulnerable being who they can kind of shape to give them what they really deserve from life. There uh, is this really touching and kind of um, haunting story. I believe it's from the book. Maybe I read it from some other material that I read while prepping for this conversation. And they've all kind of blurred together in my mind, but I think it's from the book, where uh, Miller talks about working with a patient. And the patient uh, initially described their childhood as being you know, perfectly fine. I had a normal childhood with normal parents. My parents loved me. It was not abusive. It was, you know, good situation. Um, and then as time went on, it was sort of revealed how there were these structures that were influencing the child's development. And one such example is that um, it, it was like a parent's birthday party or something like that. And they had invited these people and people didn't show up in the way that the parent wanted them to. And then the child comes home from school and they see the parent face down on the floor, just lying on the floor, just motionless. And, and the child freaks out. And they think, oh my God, is my parent dead? What's going on here? And the parent rouses and goes, oh, that's the best birthday gift you could have given me. Now I know that somebody really cares about me. Or like somebody truly loves me, whatever the language is. And so you could see how the child's been subjected to this awful experience of thinking their parent was maybe dead to serve this function for the parent. They never got what they wanted, and so now they can get it from the child. And that's really the dynamic that we're focusing on here. I can tell a personal story of this. Um, sure, yeah. To be real about it. So <clears throat> my mother grew up as the older of two kids um, in a mainly single-parent family. Mm -hmm. Her uh, father, as best I can gather, was a kind of alcoholic, talented ne'er-do-well, and parted ways. Poignantly, I, I wrote a little note to myself one time that uh, my mother's father never knew her firstborn son, because I, I never knew my grandfather. My mom was parentified, I think, with her own mother, who was a vulnerable, fragile person who'd lost everything as a little girl in the Great Depression when her wealthy family just went bankrupt and they moved into genteel poverty. So my mom was a parentified child. Um, and there were some real significant situations where she had to rescue her own mother, save her, kind of parent her younger brother. It was real. It's okay. And also, I think in some ways, my mother carried these uh, stories, these dreams of wealth and success and upper class posh ways of being that she felt. So then I came along, first of three, and uh, my I became my the vehicle of my mother's unfulfilled longings for success and high status for herself that had been lost generationally. So you see the generational impact. Uh, there's some proverb from the Bible that the, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the teeth of the sons are set on edge. 
mm. passing down, right? Yeah. Which we now understand even also with epigenetic processes that can yeah. be generational. So here I am. And it was kind of the classic uh, aspect of Miller in which there's a sort of whipsaw effect mm -hmm. in which the child is both idealized as the carrier of the parent's grandiose ambitions, uh, as the brilliant, perfect, superb, special child, especially if the child has some talents, who then must continuously live up to those standards with pretty chronic criticism of anything that in the least way falls short. So you end up then as a kid putting on that false self that seeks that kind of approval, but is wrapped around as the shell of an underlying sad, sad core of feeling inadequate and never good enough. And along the way, never really being seen as you are with the sense of, as I had chronically as a kid, that my loving and decent parents saw someone who was displaced from the real me by a foot or so to the side as a kind of an ongoing sort of experience. So that happened for me. And a lot of the healing has been for me to um, find ways to, you know, to be talented that are not tainted and caught up in that whole script and also mainly really repair over time and fill those holes inside of the deficits that were present in my own childhood in a frame of loving, decent people who were totally doing the best they could. And in which, not to blame my mom, because we have gender in here as well, my dad was a 50s dad. He was pretty checked out. He was doing his role, make a living, you know, get his career going. And um, she was left to her own and with not a very supportive environment. Anyway, that's my kind of story. Well, that's a great example of what this looks like in practice. Yeah. Uh, we've got two examples there. Mine from the book was was very dramatic, yeah. um, and yours was a little bit more lift in. And I, I want to emphasize how a lot of these stories are going to sound very normal. Yeah, and yeah. that's because they are very normal. <laughs> this is this is a relatively common thing, particularly yeah. once you move away from some of the more. Um, would you, I don't know if I'm using this language correctly, so let me know, Dad, but kind of clinical forms, if you will, of parentification or things like that, extreme examples of parentification, where um, the child is being literally positioned into that more parenting role, where they're, uh, for example, serving, I mentioned earlier, serving as a mediator, the, the parent's therapist, uh, mediating between a father and a mother, two co-parents, whatever's going on there. Or situations where one of the parents is just profoundly emotionally or physically vulnerable. And so the the child really needs to step up into a role where they're really managing dad's emotions or they're really managing mom's emotions. Or they need to actually uh, perform tasks around the house, not in the framework of a normal supportive kid doing the dishes kind of thing, but no, they're really managing the household at that point because... Dad's never there, mom's never there, or something like that. These sort of more normal range things where we talk maybe about having like a helicopter parent or uh, we talk about the, the parent who tries to be best friends with their kid and like they're my mom and they're also my best friend. And there are, there are probably healthy forms of that, but there are a lot of unhealthy forms of that that can show up too. That again, very, very common. Oh, I'm so glad you're naming these different uh, distinctions and you're exactly right. And, and I find it's, it, it's so helpful to really appreciate the accumulating weight of mm. grains of sand. Mm. <laughs> Individual mm. episodes were just a grain of sand. And yet, every day, there was a mm -hmm. big spoonful gradually adding yeah. up over time. I really saw that also in my dissertation research, which looked at interactions mm -hmm. between mothers and 15-month-olds, uh, particularly around... Uh, regulating the child around desires that were maybe problematic in the moment, and then how the parent did that, including did the parent uh, regulate the child appropriately by offering uh, positive alternatives to whatever was problematic, or finding another way to give the child what the child was requesting uh, and you know didn't know how to get. So the point for people in general, I think, is to really appreciate, without over-pathologizing your parents, the impact of seemingly little things, a lot of times people deny the impact of, you know, lots of little things. And then, absolutely, what do you do if you have a parent who's alcoholic? What do you do with a parent who's clinically depressed? What do you do with a parent who 
um, is using you for their, frankly, erotic purposes. You know, that's an extreme version. Uh, what do you do in a situation in which you have a family in which you've got a sibling with a medical issue or a parent with a medical issue, and you just have to put yourself to the side to deal with the crisis? Or you have parents who are, you know, frankly, the Miller example, just think how disturbed a parent would have to be to be so devastated that nobody showed up for their birthday party that they'd like laid sprawled out on the floor and then even potentially to do it deliberately to play dead to see how their child would as a test. That's a disturbed parent. Neither of my parents were disturbed like that. But, you know, if a parent is disturbed in that way, you know, tell the truth about it, one of the typical consequences is this lack of support for the development of the true self in the child. Yeah, yeah. And that's really what we're focusing on here. So it was really helpful for me just to summarize what you're saying, to think of this as a spectrum yeah. rather than a clear yes-no binary. Yeah. Because there are normal versions of this, and there are even um, noble versions of this, some of which you were describing, situations where there's a parent with a disability. And the family system just needs to step forward in a different kind of way to be supportive of that individual. Yeah. That is very noble. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely don't want to pathologize that in any kind of way. Like that, wow, that's really beautiful, actually. And at the same time, it can have understandable consequences for a person later in life in terms of needing to come more into contact with like, okay, but what do I want from my life? And these, And that can be a fair question alongside the very noble function of supporting the more vulnerable individual. Um, so that's one distinction here that I think is kind of useful. And then another uh, distinction that can be useful is that all parents do this to some degree. And it's okay. Like all parents project onto their children to some degree. They have normal range expectations for the behavior of that child. I was I was in no way parentified by you and mom, but you definitely had expectations for my behavior. You wanted me to succeed. You wanted me to get an A. Like, that's okay. And were there moments where mom was kind of sad and, and wanted to turn to her, her firstborn child as a source of emotional support? Yeah, absolutely that happened. But it was about the broader framework of the relationship that I had with my parents. Um, and so for me, these two kind of variables stood out, and I, I didn't see this in the research or anything anywhere, so let me know what you think, Dad, um, but this just stood out to me, is these two variables of like finding the pattern, the pattern between the relationship um, and the interactions between the parent and the child, and then this idea of differentiation. So the first one is, what's the pattern of the interactions? Are these kinds of interactions where the child is being called to support the parent uh, common, perhaps even every day? Or are they a bit more unusual? And is the typical pattern one where the parent is looking out for the emotional needs of the child or vice versa? And then second, really, really important, is the child allowed to differentiate from the parent? Do they have an opportunity to explore their interior and ask, what do I want? Or is that inquiry threatening to the parent on some level? Um, are those attempts quashed? So those are two things that really stand out to me. Oh, I'm so glad you're bringing it up yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, under the general heading that we're exploring of what happened to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the you. <laughs> so what happened to me, you, Rick? What happened to you, Forrest? What happened to you, mm -hmm. whoever's listening? And um, under the general was heading- Was that the name of Bruce's book with Oprah, by the way? Was it What Happened to You? Or Bruce Perry, who we've had on the wonderful doctor who we've had on the podcast in the past, he recently- I yeah. uh, wrote a book with Oprah that I think was titled something like What Happened to You. Oh, Great that's book. interesting. So anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and one of the things that also can derail the formation of the true self in terms of the family dynamics are uh, parents who are very religious in a particular kind of way that is really hard for the child to differentiate from. And when the child does, maybe, um, maybe marrying outside that faith tradition or moving toward agnosticism, even atheism, what does that do as a rupture yeah. even? And sometimes these issues also get surfaced when now the adult children have a child of their own. Yeah, totally, and totally. That's one. So religious background. And the other is cultural. What happens if you're a uh, second generation? let's say, a uh, beautiful family, and here you are in America, you're a teenager, and 
your parents want you to do certain things or, you know, get married in a certain kind of way. And it's you, just, you just don't resonate, just with don't that. resonate yeah. <laughs> at the least of it anymore. Yeah. That's another kind of thing that can, that can get in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take an opportunity here to, to summarize some of this stuff. Cause we've talked about a lot already. Um, so very normal situation, parent with unmet needs, uh, often emotional needs, wants for their life that maybe didn't show up for them for whatever reason. Uh, a parent themselves who probably had their own content going on, uh, they were probably quite likely put into this sort of a position inside of their own family structure and are retelling these stories now with their own children. Um, and then you have a child who has a lot of emotional sensitivity, a lot of desire to please the parent, a lot of desire to stay in relationship with them and keep getting their needs for safety and satisfaction and connection to use your classic structure, dad, uh, met by that parent. So that's the dynamic. And then the child looks at the parent and goes, okay, my best way to do this is to become essentially an ideal in your eyes, either because they get punished if they don't do that, or because they're just so uh, emotionally sensitive and attuned and kind of thoughtful uh, to the needs of the parent that they can see how distressing it is for them yeah. if they aren't the way that the parent oh, needs man. them to be. And yeah. then, okay, what happens? Well, the child gets a bit estranged from their own wants and needs. They aren't able to develop a really strong individuated sense of self. They instead get a little wrapped up in the parent. Um, maybe there's some codependency stuff that starts to pop up. Mm -hmm. And a big feature of this is that ki the kid isn't allowed to just be a kid and go through what we think of as a normal developmental progression, where you mm -hmm. go from one stage to another to another, they're skipping steps in a lot of ways. They're being placed in a position that's not developmentally appropriate for them. Um, and that development is both a bit accelerated and it's enmeshed with the needs of the parent. And so what are the consequences of this, right? Now we're getting into what shows up for people in adulthood. And one of the things that Miller talks about in, in the book that, man, have I seen in people out in the world and seen in myself from time to time in the past, is the development of uh, the, the kind of two poles of grandiosity on the one hand and then depression on the other. Grandiosity because there was this need placed on the child for them to be special and unique and a high performer and supportive of the parent and consistently showing up and on and on and on. Um, so they define themselves through what they're doing out in the world rather than who they are inside mm. of themselves. And then, of course, grandiosity always fails. Mm -hmm. People mess up. Everyone comes face to face with inadequacy yeah. eventually. You know, none of us are perfect. What happens then when the way in which you've defined yourself, which is through accomplishment, achievement, success, being able to do things for other people falls flat? Well, for a lot of people, depression. And a depression that can arise also as this experience of not having a thing inside of themselves starts to come to the front, like not having a coherent sense of who I am or of what's inside of me. And so that's the pattern that can often emerge for people. And uh, then we can talk a bit about what to do about it. Well, another related languaging is or phrase, the manic defense against depression. And it's not yeah, truly yeah. a bipolar, biologically rooted manic episode. It's kind of hypomanic, but it's sort of like uh, a person who feels like they have to keep accomplishing. They're only as good as their last performance, their last email, their last meeting, uh, their last sales encounter. And they keep moving so fast because if they slow down, boom, the undertow of feeling inadequate or and depressed uh, will catch up with them. It, but they're, they're running from their shadow and you cannot escape your shadow. A related version of this that I talked about in my own situation was idealization devaluation kind of follows the grandiosity depression thing and you're it puts you in a position as a person i could speak from experience where you're always chasing that brass ring that golden apple and it keeps moving out of your reach right and 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 you're kind of panicking deep down inside oh my god oh my god i cannot fall into that pit of self-loathing and inadequacy and emptiness and just ugh, void uh, worthlessness inside if I don't keep, you know, ticking those boxes of perfection one episode after another. 
And then you can flip it around. You can see people who um, have this childhood and, you know, who themselves become critical of others. And they are then reenacting this dynamic of, you know, really basically themselves so being so uh, resistant to any kind of devaluation, like normal criticism, taking feedback, that yeah. they react yeah. by counterattacking and devaluing the other person mm. as fast mm. as they can so they can then reestablish their equilibrium as at least as good as, quote-unquote, if not still better than. Yeah, I'd like to move to talking about what people can do about this and what people can do about these patterns um, if they feel like this was a part of their personal story, as it is for many people. And I'd like to start by just saying that one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot recently are the ways in which we hand our content down to our children broadly. And maybe that's because, you know, I'm in my my mid-30s with a stable partner, so these questions of are you going to have a kid are starting to come up kind of more prominently for me in my life. So maybe that's what's incurring these kinds of thoughts to appear for me. Um, but I think that one of the most absolutely noble things that a person can do in life is be a participant in stopping some of these generational cycles that can arise for people. Um, we recently had a conversation with Terry Real, and he began the conversation with the most haunting statement that I think maybe anyone has ever given on the podcast, which is, um, to paraphrase, I was the son of an angry, depressed man. He was the son of an angry, depressed man. My kids do not say that they are the son of an angry, depressed man. Like, wow, what a beautiful thing, right? So what we're offering, yeah, breaking the chain. So what we're, we're offering is in that context of these are problems that emerge for a lot of people. They are very normal considerations, particularly when we're talking about the light side of the spectrum. And this kind of work is hard work, and it is also unbelievably noble work. So with that disclaimer given, Dad, you had to interact with some of this in your own life. You've mentioned it already during the episode. And also... You've been a clinician for a long time. A lot of people probably walk into the office with some flavor of this appearing in their own life. What have you seen really help people? Well, most fundamentally, a kind of sacred, soulful, honest, coming home to yourself with real emotional honesty about what's it like to be you hmm. now? And what was it like to be you when you were 15, nine? two or three or four, my earliest vivid memory involves me caretaking my mother. For example, I had actually uh, was interacting with my sister. I was probably barely three, uh, if maybe two and a half or so. And I fell down and I uh, created a big gash over my one of my eyes in my forehead. So I needed to be rushed to the hospital for some stitches. And what I remember in that whole episode was this kind of eerie calm deep down inside my being, for whatever reason, as I was holding an ice cube in a tissue cloth, I remember vividly or onto my um, split eyebrow. And my mom was really uh, upset, understandably. She's a good mother. My mom was a good mother. Uh, and in me was a kind of feeling, it's okay, I'm going to be all right. It's okay. And I, I literally had a feeling a deliberateness even of being kind of soothing for her or that a recognition. She was more upset really than she needed to be, which was kind of my mother's way too, as a very kind of intense and passionate person, uh, which has many gifts in it. Anyway, so there it is, right? My earliest memory, I'm there's an aspect of it is this kind of caretakingness. So um, I think being honest with yourself is there's no replacement for that. It's super fundamental. If I could briefly, I'll just mention two specific things. Uh, yeah, one is to um, be clear about normal range necessary parenting. And there's a pitfall in either side in which we might idealize our childhood and try to whitewash what really happened, while on the other hand, getting the pitfall of mommy bashing, daddy bashing, pathologizing your parents, and frankly, some therapists- Which is easy to do, which some, is really easy to do, yeah. And so, yeah, some therapists, some programs, they, they err on that side too, or they just leave people with the parabashing side of the story 
But in a complex dynamic system, there's a lot going on. What was your parents' oh, yeah. situation? My my family situation was that um, you know my dad really really needed to bear down to grab hold of his uh, career. He was a grad student when I was born. He went from odd job to odd job, and one in particular that failed. And then he landed as an assistant professor at Cal State LA. I was, I don't know what, maybe six at the time. And then he just had to make it happen in a context in which it was a single learner family. That was the norm. So there are these influences that then put my mom in a particular situation. So, and and also as as a person now as an adult, it's appropriate for one of the functions of healthy parenting, the way I think of it, building on the Diana Baumrind model, is that parenting um, is basically three major uh, dimensions, love, aspiration, and power. I'll just call it that. And the optimal best odds combination of those three is high love, High aspiration. So you're you're calling your kids to kindness, you know, decency, trying hard, admitting fault, not being a cheater. You know, you're calling kids to that. And moderate, if not even low, assertion of power, like discipline, punishment. I've never heard that before, Dad. Maybe I need to brush up on like my parenting <laughs> content or my developmental psychology reading or whatever it is. I love that model. That's really interesting. I'm gonna think about that. All right. So yeah, so Love, power, and what was the other one that you I mentioned? I call it aspiration. Just to say it again? Aspiration. I, I think that's a really good way to think about it because it, it differentiates the idea of of expectations or yeah. morality or achievement or all of these things from like, okay, but how are we getting there? Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of the time, it's the means that's problematic, not like the goal. A lot of parents have understandable goals for their for their kids, for them yeah. to be accomplished, achieve things out in the world, whatever it is. Like I, I get why those are goals. We can have a conversation about whether or not those are good goals, but they're very understandable ones. Yeah. Um, and I think by and large, they can be very good. And then the question is like, okay, but how are we getting there? Yeah, exactly right. And um, just to give a nod to Diana Baumrind and this material that is so useful and it might be some familiar to some people, uh, imagine just two dimensions, love and power. So think of those as a two by two matrix. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, and so you imagine high love, high power is the, in Diana's simplified model, the best odds place, which she called authoritative parenting. Then imagine um, high love, low power. She called that permissive parenting. Then you could have high power, low love. She called that authoritarian Parent, parenting. So it's kind of hard or authoritative, authoritarian, but authoritarian, problematic. And then you could imagine low love, low power, neglectful parent, parenting, checked out. And you're exactly right. I think the power dimension conflates two very distinct things. You could say discipline, rules, pun, standards, punishments, whatever, on, you know, on the one hand, from the general culture of, hey, we're here to be decent people. And you share your toys and don't beat up that other kid and don't be a racist. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, all that stuff. Totally. And, you know, yeah. hey, help around the house, do some dishes. Yeah, what? Absolutely. You know, totally. Don't, don't be a total stoner. Uh, come on. You know, you're in high school. <laughs> you, you don't have to get all A's, but at least try, you know, stuff yeah. like that. You know, yeah. that's give good effort. And there's a the place for that and, totally. and opening yeah. doors and having a vision of what was possible uh, for me and my family growing up because my dad grew up on a ranch and my mom had a, relatively uneducated single mother uh, and herself with a high school education, just a vision of the possible was not even available. So there's a place for that, you know, giving a, so there's, anyway, that's, that's the big picture. So when people think back on their own parenting, I think it's important to see your parents clearly while also cutting them some slack as you form a clarity. And then the last thing I'll just say about it is to take into account uh, the ways in which you were also causal in the family system. Now, it doesn't mean you have moral culpability that an adult would have, but just factually in the system, you have some causality here. Yeah, just by maybe your temperament or your health history, maybe you just had certain kinds of needs. Also, um, there's a lot of 
research about how kids, even quite young, start to form their own conclusions about the world. It's the model mm -hmm. of the child as sort of like a young scientist, even as an mm -hmm. infant or toddler, doing little experiments, testing little things. I was definitely doing this as a kid. Yeah. So I, I totally empathize with us, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and if you look back, uh, I don't know, I'd be, what's your sense of continuity? I mean, I feel the stability of identification with uh, a point of view, an inner knowing, a willfulness, a choosing that reaches all the way back to being a very little kid. And so then it's really interesting to ask yourself, what was your role in the system? And what choices did you make that had effects? while being very clear that you're not to blame. You were a kid. Seeing the truth of it all and the causes and conditions, the complexity of it is liberating. You're speaking to the cascades of, of relationship that can occur particularly inside of families where it's a little bit like a stone rolling down a hill yeah. and a little thing creates another thing which creates another thing which creates another thing. Yeah. And uh, sometimes a version of this is known as creating a coherent narrative mm -hmm. of childhood. Yeah. Where... One of the big things that Miller points to in terms of helping people through this process um, is that many of them, as in the example that I gave earlier, begin with the story, oh, my, my childhood was great. Some of them probably begin with the opposite story and they need to be brought a little bit more toward like, no, it wasn't really that bad. Um, but most people begin with the story, oh, childhood was fine, it was normal childhood, because it's normal to them, right? Like everyone had a normal childhood inside of their own experience because it's the only one that they have reference to. Um, and then you look and you look and you see more clearly and you see with the eyes of an adult. And what can happen for people is that they have constructed a notion of the self that is very tightly tied to this particular way of being and doing out in the world. And so when you go back and you look at everything that's happened or you look at what was happening to you in childhood, the, the self has an investment in maintaining its own continuity and saying, yes, this is the way that I need to be so I can go on being in the way that I am right now. And lifting the curtain on that can be very destabilizing for people because if I am not this, then what am I? And that's really what Miller was talking about with the subtitle of the book, The Search for the True Self. Right. Because there isn't a sense internally of a true self. There is only this false self that has been created in order to fulfill the needs of other people. Now, of course, we all actually do have a true self. It's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. We just got to find it most of the time. Um, and that's where you can go through a lot of processes of going back into the childhood experience, uh, maybe particularly to use a line I really like, before the world got in the way, and start asking yourself questions like, what were my emotions back then? What did I want back then? Was I more temperamentally uh, more, of a, more of a rabbit or more of a tortoise? Did I like to just sit and read a book or did I want to be running around with the other kids? When I expressed a desire to be running around with the other kids, how did my parents respond? Did they want me to just go inside and read a book? When I sat down to read a book, how did my parents respond? Did they want me to go out and run around with the other kids? Like we can see the ways in which we get pressured out of very normal parts of ourselves, of our temperament, of our desires, of our wants and needs. Um, I mean, this stuff gets really thorny when you start looking at uh, gender identity and sexual orientation and the ways in which our parents put pressure on us to be certain kinds of ways in front of them. Um, and these are all soft power moments a lot of the time. Sometimes they're hard power, but a lot of the time it's soft power. It's the gentle inclination again and again. Um, and it's only by really going back and taking a look at really what happened here, like you were saying, Dad, really what happened? What was the dynamic? that we can start doing this process of unearthing the stuff that isn't really us and finding the stuff underneath it that is more authentic to us. Beautifully said. Um, oh, thank you. I had, you know, having walked this road with some people. Yeah, please, please. Maybe three things just right off the top come to me. And I awesome. say three because it helps me remember, remember them. <laughs> First, uh, beware these sort of compelling, seductive, uh, narratives that float around in psychology these days that can be overly reductionistic. And you can feel overly kind of slotted into or incorporated into that model 
that a, a glib therapist or a friend who's read one too many books about psychotherapy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or watched. The, are you are you calling me out here, Dan? No, 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 no. Am I the character no, 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 in this? No, 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 no. <laughs> or has been listening. I don't know. To just lay some kind of simplistic, reductionistic, uh, yeah, you totally. know, terminology or diagnosis on somebody, or to do it on yourself. So be aware of that. Point one. Point two. Paul Gilbert, wonderful psychologist in England. He's got the order of the British Empire, actually. The only friend I have who has an official, you know, I, I don't know any knights yet, let alone lords and ladies. But anyway, uh, he founded Compassion Focused Therapy, just brilliant, great. He has a phrase uh, that he was talking about recently that is really helpful, he thinks, for people. When we go back to our own childhood and including reckoning with our own causality in it as a little kid or a teenager, let's say, or as an adult, Right? I mean, as we're doing this episode, I'm rewinding my parenting of you and your sister. Like, whoa. <laughs> <You Uh-oh. know? laughs> and so <laughs> as you look at that, Paul has this yeah. lovely phrase grief, not shame. If there is remorse, I feel remorse about the ways I withheld love, especially from my mother when I was young, as a weapon, as a payback. I, I feel I cringe inside. Right now, as I said, I feel sad about it and remorseful. Okay, as a parent, I feel remorse uh, and uh, about certain things I did when you, you guys were young. Got it. We've certainly talked about that some in our own family. There's a place for that. But don't get lost in it because often the, 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 the fear of crippling guilt, shame, remorse makes us swerve away from truth-telling. And what's more fundamental, as Paul speaks to, is grief. It's just sad. It's sad that it, that it went down like that. It went down like that for 50 reasons, maybe three of which had to do with you. But the rest of it, it went down. And there's a place for grief, for mourning and feeling it, including things that will never be changeable. You can't, they're irreparable. I will never be able to talk with my mother because uh, she's no longer alive right now. I can't clean this up any further. Although there are things we can do in our innermost being, you know, with the ways in which the parent still lives inside us, in which we can speak with them in our own minds. But grief, not shame. And then last, to uh, tip my hat to a psychologist that I did a case conference with for a couple of years, who was a big influence on me, genius, brilliant uh, woman, Carla Clark. She made a comment once that has stayed with me forever that it is simply the authentic expression of the self that is really healing. Simply being genuine and authentic and including all the parts of ourselves and telling the truth and being in our feelings while we talk about them, not just reporting on them remotely as if from a distant battlefield. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the path, and that's absolutely been the path for me. Vulnerable, authentic communication, heartfelt, open-hearted, speaking for myself, being in the heart while I say it, being honest about it, copying to our, my stuff as part of it, but most fundamentally, just the full expression of, of ourselves is itself integrating and healing and helps us come home to our true self because it's the expression of the true self. Yeah, I I want to plant a flag in grief, not shame. For starters, I think that's a phenomenal phrase. And in, in my experience, and give me your take on this as an actual real-life clinician, Dad, but like in my experience, reflective work is almost always grief work. Um, looking back into the past, thinking about what could have been, there is a mourning process that can be associated with that with people. Mm. You know, grieving the possibility, grieving the childhood you didn't have, grieving the relationship with your parents that you didn't have. Um, and, it's, and it's often only by coming to terms with that emotional discomfort, because there yeah. is emotional discomfort associated with it, of course, that we are able to access those other layers, whatever the other layers are, more authentic sense of self, the ability to move into what you were talking about at the end there in terms of that earnest expression of our own needs. And I, I can say personally in my own process that I was able to get to a place where I felt more emotionally earnest and free and open and vulnerable with other people only after going through the emotional pain, only after having the big cry, only after screaming into the pillow. 
it was after I did all of that that I could get to a place where I felt comfy being open and earnest and honest about how I felt with those around me and being open with myself about it too, being able to be honest with myself about it. So I, I do think that sometimes when you're doing this kind of work, there is a level of emotional discomfort that is the price of entry. And you gotta be, you gotta be willing to, to pay, pay the ferryman, as they say, um, in order to get across the river here a little bit. It's poignant, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. where we started. I talked about this as a very soulful, tender topic. And yeah. part of it, too, um, is, is a reclaiming. When you think of mm, the true self, mm -hmm. the true yeah. self, who you really are in, in your nature. So claiming your nature. Uh, also claiming feelings that have been disowned, maybe you're pushed to the side. Uh, being honest and real about uh, desires and forces inside you that aren't always so pretty. And to own that. Okay, so we're claiming it all. There's a place for claiming it all, certainly. And sometimes uh, to get to the, the grief part, just the poignance of life, life. Uh, you got to go through the rage. Oh yeah, for sure. And yeah, it was true for me and true for I think people. As a phase that hopefully you don't get stuck in, you get in touch with the suppressed rage that many many children have. But it's on the way to a fundamental love and peacefulness kind of a tender understanding, a compassion for all the players. You get to a place you realize, hello, humanity. Welcome to uh, common humanity. Anyway, yeah, you, and then you get to a place, honestly, of growing freedom. It's okay to be you. It's okay to be you. You start relaxing more and more about the inner critics. You don't feel like you're running scared from memories and you know emotional learning, better said, from your childhood. Yeah, and you also, I think, get increasingly drawn to people who themselves are emotionally integrated and are, who support you. And that's why I think it's so important to really ask yourself, am I supporting the true self of this other person? Am I making it safe for them? Am I creating room for them? This really goes into sometimes if you have you know, culturally situated forms of advantaged power and status, you can make it safe for people who have been disadvantaged or ha you know, haven't had your privileges along the way, uh, to feel safer, you can do that, and to make room for others to be themselves. And you can feel that when you're with someone who just accepts you in a mm. profound, rock-bottom sort of way. And these are qualities we can cultivate in ourselves as wonderful gifts yeah. to others. Yeah, and well, I really love that, for starters. And also, um, as we kind of come to the end here, one of the things that we've talked about over and over again on the podcast, and I think it is so valuable here, is the idea of what were the emotional experiences that you were permitted, or even more importantly, maybe permitted yourself when you were young? What were the emotions that you were allowed to feel? What were the emotions that you were not allowed to feel? Because you, you mentioned anger there, Dad, anger and rage. And often these are experiences that children are not permitted in uh, particularly more authoritarian styles of parenting. Um, and including sometimes in some permissive styles of parenting because the children get bribed all the time, so they get bribed out of their anger. But yeah, so th and that's something that can be really valuable to look at in terms of that search for the true self. What are the emotions that are lingering beneath the surface that need to be emptied a little bit at a time in mm -hmm. order to get down to the bottom of the emotional experience? And not skipping steps, I think, is something that you're alluding to there, not feeling like you need to jump to the grief. Maybe yeah. you need to work through the rage first. Like that is yeah. totally okay and often very understandable. Uh, an episode that I think we're probably going to do in the future that I was just looking through our catalog and trying to see where where maybe the, the empty spots were. Mm. Um, I want to do an episode on identifying your wants and your needs. Mm. Because we've talked about accepting the nature of needs yeah. and the presence of needs but really identifying for people. And we've gotten a lot of emails recently uh, from people saying something to the effect of, well, you talk about really coming into contact with your own wants and needs and like, yes, I know that I must have them, but like, I, where do I find them? What do I do? Uh, and so I would like to do a, an episode on that, which I, I do really think is is very critical to this idea of finding the true self and asking, what what do I really want? What do I really need from this life for people who have pushed their wants and needs to the side? But 
For purposes of today's episode, I think we talked about a lot of stuff today. I had a great time doing it. Um, so thanks for coming along for the ride while we talked about parentification and the gifted child. We began today's conversation by explaining a relatively common dynamic that can emerge in parent-child relationships, particularly in situations where the parent is a bit more emotionally needy or vulnerable, and the child is particularly emotionally attuned to their needs. When this happens, an inversion of the typical structure can occur, where typically parents look out for the emotional needs of their children and are very supportive of them. But in these cases, an inversion happens where the child begins to look after the emotional needs of the parent. A lot of the content for today's episode came from Alice Miller's fantastic book, The Drama of the Gifted Child. The gift in this case isn't an intellectual gift, it's the gift of high emotional sensitivity. The child is just so aware of the needs of the parent, and also is aware of the fact that the best way to stay in relationship with that parent and to continue to receive their love and affection is by meeting those emotional needs. So they devote themselves to fulfilling the parent's needs rather than meeting their own. And a major consequence of this is that the child loses touch with their needs. What do I really want? How am I actually when I'm not in relationship with this other person? And this leads to the creation of a false self, a version of who they are that can keep on meeting the parent's unmet psychological needs. So the child's authentic emotional experiences, their desires and their wants and needs are repressed in order to benefit the parent. And I wanna take a moment here and highlight that parents, generally speaking, do not do this deliberately. Uh, this is based on their own personal history, the structures that existed inside of their family, and the ways in which, frankly, they just didn't get what they wanted from their life or from the world around them. Then there are some parents who are just emotionally vulnerable or maybe a little disorganized in terms of their own psychology. Maybe they're a little borderline-ish or a little bipolar-ish and they just have really high needs for external emotional regulation. Kids are sensitive and they get that dad gets really angry sometimes or mom is kind of sad and they do what they can to help their parents through those difficult emotional moments in really understandable and normal ways. And one of the ways that they do this is by working to become an ideal in the eyes of their parent, either because if they don't, they get punished, or more commonly because they're just so emotionally attuned that they can see how distressing it is when they don't show up in a particular kind of way for their parents. Parentification, which is the more clinical presentation of this, tends to take two big forms. The first is instrumental parentification, which involves the child completing a lot of adult tasks for the family. This could include everything from looking after other members of the family, uh, often younger children, but not always, to making money and paying the bills through their work out in the world. Then there's emotional parentification, which I would guess is probably a bit more common, which occurs when the child serves as an emotional support or a confidant for one or both parents, or maybe serves as a mediator between the two of them, or maybe serves as one of the parents' therapist. And it was really helpful for me to think about this as a spectrum rather than a binary yes, no, because all parents want things from their kids and want things for their kids. And that's really normal. We have expectations for the behavior of children. And it's natural for us to want our children to succeed. It's also normal for parents to look to their kids as a source of emotional support and regulation from time to time. And a big part of being a kid is learning how to be an adult. So these can all be very normal experiences. And for me, what stands out are these two variables. The first one is pattern and the second one is differentiation. What's the common pattern of interaction between the parent and the child? And then second question, is the child allowed to differentiate from the parent? Are they allowed to explore their own wants and needs? And are they supported in doing so by the parent? And to illustrate these examples of what being the gifted child can look like, Rick gave a lot of examples from his own life. And he would be the first to say that he was on the light side of parentification. He was fulfilling a psychological function for his mom fairly regularly. But these were all normal range experiences by and large that he was going through. And one of the things that he really highlighted were the ways in which this gets passed down through systems. Uh, his mom had her own challenges growing up with her parents. And they were situated inside of a broader social environment that was very 50s, 60s Americana, 
where the husband goes out and makes the money and the mom stays at home and looks after the kids. She didn't really have a lot of external emotional support from other people. There were very real challenges here. We then talked for a little while at the end about what we can do about all of this. And one of the things that Miller emphasizes in her book is the importance of going back in and being clear-eyed about this whole thing, being open and honest with yourself about what you went through, being really clear about what actually happened, and understanding that there is often a tendency to create a rose-tinted view of the experiences that we went through, to essentially normalize them, because they were normal for us. They were normal inside of our one individual experience with childhood, because we only get our own experience, right? And often without blame, we can go back in and take a look at what happened and see it clearly, see how it affected us, see how we were put into positions that maybe we shouldn't have been put in, to see how we went through challenges that maybe we shouldn't have had to go through. And some questions that can be really useful here are what emotions were you permitted as a child? Then what roles did you feel like you had to inhabit? And finally, what did you feel you needed to do in order to earn love? And I think that word earn is really essential to this whole conversation. We had a just a great episode with uh, Gabor Matei recently that we haven't been able to release yet, but I'm excited to share that one with you when we can share it. And one of the things that he emphasized was that one of the fundamental needs of children is to be able to be just as they are and to be loved by their family and to know that they will be loved just as they are, that they don't have to do anything to earn that love from their parents. Because what happens when we feel like we need to earn that love, earn that safety, earn that security, earn a stable environment where we can go on being as very vulnerable children, is that we start to define ourselves through relationship. We aren't worthy just for being a being, we're worthy because of what we can do for others. And that creates a whole internal cosmology that is like a house of cards, because nobody's perfect, everybody falls short. And when that inevitably happens, all of our self-worth comes tumbling down because it was founded on a lie. And the lie is that you have to do something in order to be loved. And so we go through this soulful and vulnerable process of searching for a truer version of the self, of identifying who we really are down deep inside. And I think that there is really no more honorable work in the world than that, in part because it allows us to stop some of these generational cycles that can emerge inside of families. So that's it for today's episode. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate it. If you took a moment to subscribe through whatever platform you're listening to the podcast right now on, it really does help us out. And also, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple of dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. If you have a second, I would also really appreciate it if you took a moment to rate and review the show, leave a positive comment about it. And the absolute best way that we have to reach new people is if you just tell a friend about the show. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon.